Hi, so yeah, my name is Conrad Watt, and I'm going to talk today about a program logic for first order encapsulated WebAssembly. And this work was done in collaboration with Peter Maximovic, Neil Krishnaswamy, and Philippa Gardner. So a brief kind of rundown of what WebAssembly is. WebAssembly is a low-level bytecode that's now been implemented in all major browsers, and it's sold as a compilation target for the web. So the idea is if you have some C code that you'd like to run in someone's browser, you can compile that to WebAssembly, embed it in your website, and then run that in the browser with near-native performance. And WebAssembly is kind of interesting to us because it already comes with a completely precise formal specification that's maintained by the working group that specifies the language already. And WebAssembly is interesting in terms of why we would need a program logic for it, because this is how WebAssembly is used in the real world. You will have um, a web user and a web developer who are just using some big blob of WebAssembly code. So we become interested in trying to verify that WebAssembly code for the same reason that people have been looking at program logics for bytecode and platform assembly before now. So in terms of the specific properties of WebAssembly and what that means for any program logic that's reasoning about it, well, we have to kind of look at the fact that WebAssembly is stack-based, but it comes with this type system that means you can um, predict and guarantee a lot of the kind of behaviors of the stack. So actually, the reasoning about the stack becomes quite simple because of its type system. And also, unlike, for example, the Java bytecode, WebAssembly doesn't have unstructured control flow. Instead, it has these loop and uh, block opcodes that we're going to be looking at later. And then another reason WebAssembly is interesting is because it has this module system which interoperates with JavaScript, and you have lots of strange higher-order behaviors that come out of that. And so for this work, uh, we're just going to look at the first two. And this creates this nice envelope. We can design the program logic that we know uh, captures WebAssembly's stack behavior and WebAssembly's control flow correctly. And then we leave the problem of doing all of this higher order JavaScript interop uh, for future work. So, as I said, WebAssembly is stack based. It's specified using a formal uh, small step semantics. Uh, and every WebAssembly program has to be validated, uh, as in type checked, before it's allowed to be run. So, here's a very simple example of a WebAssembly program fragment executing. Uh, it kind of looks like a reverse Polish notation interpreter. You have uh, these two const operations, which add things to the stack, and then you have the add, which pops two things off the stack and adds the result back on. Uh, and in terms of what WebAssembly's type system looks like at a brief sketch, WebAssembly's types can be viewed as functions uh, talking about how you transform one stack into another stack. So you have the const operation, which, starting with an empty stack, will put one thing of the right type on the stack. You have the add operation, which, starting with a stack with two things on it, will give you back the stack with the result, one thing of the correct type. And then you have this little program fragment we looked at earlier, where if you start with a stack that's empty, well, once you've run the entire fragment, you'll end up with just the result of adding those two consts together. And then finally, you can have an ill-typed stack where I've pushed a float on, and then I'm trying to add it. Uh, but using an integer add operation. So this uh, program fragment would not even be allowed to execute at all into the, in the WebAssembly semantics. And uh, a clue from kind of when I talk about WebAssembly is uh, the types is transforming stack to stack, you get some structural rules. And so the structural rule on the left is saying, if I have some sequence of instructions which transform a stack into another stack, well, then I can also give you the, uh, those instructions the type where you're transforming a bigger stack, but you're leaving the base untouched. So you're allowed to do that. And then also, if you have two different groups of instructions that are both transforming the stack, you can compose them together and get the result of running them one after the other. Um, now we're on to WebAssembly's control flow. So as I said, WebAssembly doesn't have go to. Instead, it has these blocks. And blocks have this precise type annotation which says that whenever you have a block and you're forced to give a type annotation to it, the body of the block must have precisely that type. So what this means is, without even looking at what's actually inside the block, I know if I run it to completion, starting with a bunch of values of type TA star, I'll end up with a bunch of values of type TB star. 
But a block isn't just about straight line execution. You can also terminate a block early by executing a BR instruction. And you can think of this as like a break. Sometimes it acts like more like a continue from JavaScript, and we'll talk a bit about that later. But a block is indexed inwards to outwards. Uh, sorry, excuse me. A, br a BR instruction is indexed inwards to outwards according to which block it's targeting. So here you have a BR1 instruction, uh, which is indexing not the inner block, but the outer block. It's, it's zero indexed. And once the BR instruction is executed, it will immediately jump to the end of the block it's targeting. And what this means for the type system is at the point you execute the BR instruction, you need to make sure that you have exactly the things on the stack that will allow you to satisfy the result type of the block you are breaking. So here are the typing rules. Uh, as I said, you're executing this block in one way or the other, whether that's because the E has a break, the B E star has a break in it, or because it just executes the completion, you're going to end up with something of the right type. So to type a block with a particular type, firstly, you need to type its body with the type annotation. Uh, but in addition, you have this additional label context here, which is saying, OK, this is recording the type you need to have at the point you execute a BR instruction. And the typing rule for a BR instruction is just down there. It looks inside this label list. And if you're breaking to the kth block, you look for the kth type that you've recorded. And you just say, I have to have that type in the stack at the point I execute the BR. And finally, you have the if opcode, which is like one of two blocks. And which one you execute will depend on you pop a value off the stack, an I32. And if it's not 0, you execute the first body. If it's 0, you execute the second body. And in particular, both bodies must satisfy the one type annotation. So there's no ability in WebAssembly for different control flow paths to end up with different amounts or different types of things on the stack. You always uh, statically know exactly what you have on the stack because the type annotation constrains all the execution paths. So intuitively from this, WebAssembly stacks should actually be quite easy to reason about. We have a lot of kind of structural information from the types that just mean that we don't need to worry about all these cases where you have one branch of an if that pushes two things and another branch of the if that pushes three things, because the type annotation constrains that both paths must push exactly the same number of things. And because of this, we can always just um, make our assertions about the stack uh, just a fixed size list, and that makes the structure of the assertions and the reasoning a lot easier. Now, WebAssembly also has a heap, um, but this is just like a regular heap from any programming language you might be familiar with. So what this means is it's natural for us to also introduce separation logic connectives when we're reasoning about the heap part of WebAssembly. So this is the kind of top-level view of what a WebAssembly assertion is going to look like in our program logic. You have top-level assertions, which denote kind of properties about WebAssembly state, and these assertions have a stack and a heap part. Now, the stack part is always just a list, and the list is of a fixed size, and you can interpret it as saying, I have a stack which is exactly this size, and each individual value on the stack satisfies this kind of term that we've got there inside the list. And then your heap assertions look very much like regular separation logic assertions. You have all of your pure logical connectives, you have separation, separating conjunction, you have heap cells. And the one thing that is a little unique here is you have this extra size thing here. And this is just a resource you need to carry around because of the way WebAssembly does memory allocation. And we're going to talk about that in more detail later. And then just at the bottom, you have your regular terms, your local and global variables, and your constants, which are just the same as in any other language. So a WebAssembly specification will be a pre and a post condition, which is familiar from Hall logic. It, uh, except now our pre and post conditions are these assertions that have both a stack, a heap part, and some number of existentially quantified variables. And you also have this context, which is keeping track of some things you need for the proof. So the F and the A part of the context are uh, record keeping about functions for when you're doing mutually recursive uh, proof, uh, proofs about mutually recursive functions. And that's just standard from other Horum separation logics. And some of the more WebAssembly specific parts of the context are this L and R part. And these are keeping track of the assertion version of the types that you saw earlier in the typing rules. Because if you're inside a block and you execute a BR, you need to make sure that you're satisfying the post condition of that block at the point you execute the BR. And we'll see some examples of this in a second. So to start with, we really get to see that reasoning about the stack is very simple. 
So this con these constant adds operations, which are just manipulating operations on the stack, really just say, okay, if I have an empty list and I execute const, I end up with the actual value on the stack. And if I execute an add, I must have two things on the stack, and then I end up with one thing. That's the addition of those things. And I'm not writing tau1 plus tau2 there, because this add could be something like a floating point addition, where the function is a little more complicated to reason about. So looking at these rules, you'll see I'm saying start with an empty stack, you can add one thing. But you can also just frame on extra bits of stack that you're not using, and you can just do this in an arbitrary way. And this is exactly like the typing rule I showed earlier, where you can uh, generalize a type to say, I'm not touching the bottom of the stack. And for the heap rules, you just have some very standard looking load and store operations, which will look very familiar from separation logic, with the slight um, kind of uh, bit you need to think about, which is, that in WebAssembly, you additionally have this static offset that comes with every load and store operation. So in addition to just saying, okay, I'm accessing a cell at this address, you also have to um, actually take into account the offset and just make sure you're owning the right cell. And now we come to WebAssembly's control operations. So the first thing to notice here is look how closely these operations are actually following the typing rules. So remember block typing. You check that the body has the same type, but then you also have this little label context you're carrying around, which will tell you when you jump, when you um, break, sorry, that you are satisfying the correct type at the point you break. In the proof world, instead of carrying around a type, you're carrying around the post condition. And what this then means is that when you're proving something about a BR, you look in your label context and you just check that if, you've, if I've got a P in there, I have to have a P as my host condition at the point I execute a BR. And then you can just pick an arbitrary Q because the BR is never actually going to terminate in a straight line. It's always going to break back to the end of the block. So WebAssembly also has a loop op code. And this acts exactly like block, except when you break to it, you go back to the start of the loop rather than the end of the block. And all this means for the proof rules is that instead of putting Q in the context, you put a P there instead, and then the P just becomes like the invariant of the loop. And this is exactly the same as the loop typing rules. And then finally, for if, all if is doing is you just have to check that both bodies satisfy the single post condition Q. And this is all fine because the type system, you, you don't need to worry about kind of disjunctions of differently shaped stacks, because WebAssembly is gonna make sure that no matter which branch you execute, the stack is always going to have the same shape. And now we have to kind of go in a little detour and talk about WebAssembly's specific allocation. Because WebAssembly is actually a concrete language, and we can't just uh, say the allocator is non-deterministic. We have to do what WebAssembly semantics says it does. And what WebAssembly semantics says it does is you always execute in terms of page, uh, you always allocate in terms of pages. So at the point you do an allocation, you need to make sure that you know where those things are going to end up. So you just carry this little resource around called the size resource that's basically just keeping track of the state of the allocator. And owning this resource gives you permission to do a grow. And if you were in a concurrent context in some future extension of the logic, you might experience interference on this resource because multiple threads are growing at once. And then finally, the frame rule looks pretty standard. You just have to distribute it inside the heat part. But you also have to fr frame on all of the label context bits you're keeping track of. And this is like a higher order frame rule, even though our logic is only considering a first order fragment of WebAssembly. And this may not be surprising if you look at logics and how they have to handle uh, program languages with continuations in them. You kind of have a similar rule there. Our soundness proof is mechanized in Isabel against an existing um, mechanized semantics of the official small step semantics. Uh, and we, excuse me, our proof rules are verified against the mechanized semantics. And we hand verify a simple bead tree example just to make sure that we got our proof rules right and the logic is really as expressive as we want it to be. Next steps, um, do higher order, do concurrency, implement some verification tools, and maybe as a stretch goal, have some kind of standard library of verified data structures. And that's it. Uh, thanks, Conrad. Um, uh, so I, I was wondering if over the course of developing this program logic for WebAssembly, 
um, there is any sort of uh, opportunity for sort of feedback back to the design of the WebAssembly language. It, like, are there any bits where you you wish WebAssembly had been designed in a different way that would have made it easier for analyzing with a program logic? Uh, that's a really interesting question. So I think most of that kind of feedback happened at the point I was doing the earlier mechanization of the rules, and there were a couple of times like that. But having done that, the program logic kind of fell out very naturally. Uh, I think the language is actually designed really well, especially after all the previous feedback that's gone into it. Thank you. Other questions? So what kind of uh, properties you can prove uh, with this program logic? So I mean, this is a, it is a separation logic. So in principle, it, it should be just the same kind of expressivity you get from the ability to do like any separation logic proof for any language. Our specific aim with, with this logic was when you're doing proofs about WebAssembly, it should be no harder than doing proofs about any other language in a separation logic style even though you're dealing with this slightly weird control flow and slightly weird stack. Okay, thanks. So I was wondering, um, is there anything in your work on WebAssembly that you see as generalizing to other current or future um, programming languages, higher or low level, or is it all the work specifically very much. So, so, so speaking to the program logic thing, um, this, these proof rules for loop and block, uh, okay, I guess I should just disconnect, but the proof rules for loop and block where you end up um, messing with this label context, that kind of looks like the way you handle continuations in other language, languages, but if you look at the kind of related work around this, there doesn't appear to be a program logic specifically for something with like a break and continue style while loop. So, so for example, I was surprised there's no Java logic that has this kind of proof rule. So I think there is space to kind of look at other languages and see could a proof rule like this work in a language that has while loops with break and continue. Because I think it is the right proof rule. I was just surprised not to see existing work using it. Okay, let's thank Conrad again and have the next speaker. For that.